We can kick off the meeting. Um, it's actually becoming a public hearing. And all right, who is it that's doing this? Chris, are you the one who's our person? So Chris Quinn is going to take over from here and we're running a public hearing at this point. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we need to explain any more at the moment. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen and well, I have a presentation on the redistricting. So just a second to pull that up. Let's see. Is that showing? Yes. Okay, yeah. great. So first of all, uh, just for purposes of introductions, uh, I'm Chris Quinn, I work in the planning department and I'm the one that's managing the uh, redistricting process from the staff end. And um, we appreciate you allowing us to share some of your meeting, uh, meeting time so that we can count this as one of our public meetings. Uh, this is the second of five meetings. We had the first one today at noon. So the purpose of this is really to inform the public of the redistricting process and hear your comments. Let us know what you think the board should be thinking as we move forward uh, through the rest of this process. Just a little bit of background. I think pretty much everybody obviously on the CAC is aware of this, but if there are any members from the public that might have plugged in, uh, RTD is governed by a 15 member elected board. Elections are nonpartisan, four year terms for each board member. Elections are staggered. Uh, so every two years, approximately half the board is up for reelection. Um, but the part that we're most concerned about right now is we do redraw the districts every 10 years following the release of the decennial census. The goal is to make sure that each director district is roughly equal in population. And obviously, since we've had so much growth in the metro area, the growth, the growth is a little bit lopsided, uh, generally more to the north and the east than the west. So uh, we do recognize that in order to uh, each achieve some level of population, uh, equal populations for districts, we are going to have to redistrict. And if we don't, if the board doesn't adopt the map by March 15th, that's our state statute deadline, the legislature will come in and drop their own map. So we do have quite a bit of uh, incentive to do our own. So the process that we've worked under is that the board chair established an ad hoc redistricting committee to guide the process. And they began monthly meetings in September. Those meetings are shown, are, are, those meetings are both posted and uh, the materials for those are on uh, our redistricting webpage. And I'll give you the link to that at the end. Meetings are open to the public and we're also having a series of public meetings and public hearings. So in November, the board adopted a criteria for us to follow uh, as we move through this process. Some of these items are actually required by state statute and some of these are just what the board felt was a good, a good framework for us to use moving forward. Uh, in general, the most uh, important ones you can read through on your own, but want to try to achieve equality or population, um, some level of population equalness amongst the districts so that of the mean population per dis for district, which is gonna be a roughly 205,000, we wouldn't have more than a 5% deviation above or below that. Also wanna ensure that race is not a predominant consideration in the formation of the districts, Compli compliance with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. We also uh, obviously need to preserve whole voter precincts so that we don't have a director district line that splits a precinct, in which case that would be an election nightmare. Um, obviously wanna keep them compact and reasonably straight lines wherever possible. And then this is a fairly important one. We need to ensure that no district is left without representation and don't wanna draw districts to protect either an existing board member or an incumbent candidate. 
and then try to preserve communities of interest, um, especially political subdivisions such as uh, counties, towns, and cities as much as possible. Last time we did this effort was obviously, we would have been after the 2010 decennial census. So we finished that, uh, we completed that in March of 2012. Um, at that time, the district was 2.7 million people and the average director district had, uh, came out with about 178,000 residents per district. So we've now gone from 2.7 million up to almost 3.1 million. And so now the average director district size is going to be about 205,000. The map you see here on the right side of the slide, it illustrates the where the growth has occurred, or where the growth has occurred most intensely. All of the districts did grow. Those that are shown in the blue, the light blue, dark blue, those are the ones that grew the most, and those need to lose some of their population in order to get down to the 205,000. And then those that you see generally more to the west, the tan and the browns, those need to gain population to get to the 205,000. And just as kind of a one uh, piece of note, um, District I, which includes Longmont right down through Broomfield, uh, a little bit Westminster, Thornton, that is the district that uh, grew the most and has to lose the most residents. And then District N, which is kind of Southwest Jefferson County into the foothills, that one is the one that needs to gain the most residents. So the, uh, the board's ad hoc redistricting committee has recommended that we move forward with two maps for public review. And one of them, they're labeled as map alternative E and F. Alternative E focuses on keeping the director dis district boundaries to the extent possible, consistent with local jurisdictional boundaries and county boundaries. Also while keeping within that framework of the 5% above or 5% below the mean population, which again is the 205,000. Alternative F takes a slightly different approach and this one tries to get each one of the director district boundaries as close to 205,000 as possible so that nearly every pop, nearly every district would then be equal. But the cost of that is then the jurisdictional boundaries aren't, we're, we're not able to adhere to, adhere to those as closely as we were with uh, alternative E. And the result of that is there are some director districts that now span a few more local jurisdictions and or counties. These are the two maps. And I know that, you know, seeing them on a screen this size, uh, it, it's hard to get a real clear sense of exactly what's going on, especially compared to what's out there right now. Again, alternative E on the left side, focusing on following the jurisdictional boundaries and then alternative F focusing on getting the population as close as possible. Our next steps are, we are, we've started our series of public meetings beginning today. On January 31st, the redistricting committee will meet again and based on any input that we may have received from either the board or the public, uh, we might have an altered map which would be released to the public on the, or on the 31st. We begin the public hearings on February 9th. And then the intent is uh, after a final committee meetings that the board would adopt the final map on uh, their meeting on March 8th. So our reasoning for going out to the public here, it, it are, what is it you think the board should be considering? Um, Certainly we can take those comments now. And then also want to make it known that we do have the, uh, a redistricting webpage. You see the address up there now. If you can't remember this, which I wouldn't be able to remember this, if you just uh, type into a search engine, RTD re redistricting, it will take you right to the redistricting webpage. On that page, we have the two maps, uh, both the alternatives, well, actually we have all the alternatives that we've ever looked at, but we have uh, detailed maps of uh, the two remaining alternatives. And on those maps, you can zoom right in to find out how the new boundaries correspond with local jurisdictional lines, 
as well as state and uh, state house and congressional boundaries as well. So you can see the bigger puzzle. Each district is blown up onto its own page. So again, you can really get into the nitty gritty of that. Uh, the website also has a box where you can submit comments. And um, I, oh, and those comments can be submitted through February 22nd. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to you know, open it up to any comments the group may have. All right, who's got any comments, anyone? Yeah, Chris, this is Matt Applebaum. I, I, nice to see you again, by the I, way. Indeed, indeed. Um, I, I was just going to first ask, and I was looking at the people on the call, um, is there anybody here from the public, in other words, somebody who's not a member of the CAC? Because if there is, I'd be happy to let them take a first crack at it. I don't think we've got anyone, uh, Matt. Okay. Well, if somebody does show up, let's just keep our eye on that because, I mean, I may not notice that. Well, well, Chris, I can ask you one or two questions just to get the ball rolling and maybe people have some other ideas. I did take a quick look at the, the maps, but they are hard to decipher. Even on a big screen that I have, they're hard to decipher. There's a lot, a lot going on. Um, um, let's see. Uh, with the option that's plus or minus 5%. Chris, could you go to that, that map? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're hard to see, but I, my, my question isn't specific about a boundary. That's, that's frankly a little beyond me. It's just more trying to figure out, I mean, if plus or minus 5%, my interpretation means there could be a district that's plus 5%, there could be one that's minus 5%. Yes. Be really a ten percent, which in this case is about a twenty thousand person difference. That's not massive, um, certainly, and I don't know that it's enough to particularly worry about. But it, I assume that interpretation is correct. That's correct. Okay, and are the districts that would be the most out of whack in alternative E? In fact, the one that has the most population, namely Longmont, and then the one that has the needs the most pop population, namely Southwest Jeffco, or does it turn out some other way? Uh, I don't recall off the top of my head which ones are most and least. Um, certainly, some you know it's something we could probably post on the website. We have a I think we have a table um, that. Shows how each one of the districts fare under the two alternatives. Okay. So we could add that to the website, yeah. or and I could send it out. We could send it out to you guys as a group. Well, I think it'd be useful. I mean, I, I, my only comment on that is, and I'm probably okay with it, is if the district or dix, districts that have too many people have the kind of ten, fifteen thousand too many people, if they feel, yeah. We're being underrepresented now, or whether they would feel, um, no, that's okay, because we'd rather keep the community together. We'd rather keep the city together or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, and I mean, normally for redistricting, I might not ask a question like that of them. But in this case, it might be reasonable to ask them if that gives them some unhappiness or whether you know indeed it's okay fine we got 10,000 too many people or 15,000 but you know what we'd much rather keep the community together because that works for us. Um, Matt can I ask and then we got a couple people with raised hands but I want to uh, ask a follow-up question on that concept when you're talking about keeping jurisdictional boundaries together it looks like that's focused on counties and we still have multiple uh, local jurisdictions that are split among uh, board there, there is still some, yeah, there is still some splitting, you are correct. Uh, Don't we have more real interaction on, on service delivery issues with local jurisdiction cities rather than counties? I mean, I, I, don't, I wonder if board members here 
more about issues from uh, cities uh, than they do from counties as far as service and things like that. I think that's a really good, I'll just say, Roger, I think that's a really good point. Um, counties are so diffuse in a way when it comes to RTD because the counties often have cities that have good transit service and then they've got outlying areas that frankly have lousy transit service. And, you know, the cities, frankly, is where most of the ridership comes from. So I think that's a great point, is trying to more keep the denser city-type communities together um, as opposed to the more diffuse counties. Ben, it looks like you're next. Yeah, well, I, you know, at this scale, the maps look remarkably similar. I mean, it really, it, it's, it's kind of amazing. It really looks like, like Jeffco, Boulder, border, there's some stuff going on, but I'm, I'm amazed at how similar they are at the, you know, at the, and I know at the scale is awfully small, but I would, I would think just maybe following up on that discussion, it's, it's way more important to honor jurisdictional boundaries than to, you know, fuss and fuss to get populations exactly the same. And so th that would just be a general comment on my part. Thank you. Andrea, it looks like your hands up. Yes, it, as near as I can tell, Arapahoe County is a mess. So I definitely wouldn't worry about the county as much as like Matt said, the cities, trying to keep the cities together. And I know Centennial runs through, I believe, three different districts. So there's not much that can be done about then, about that. But I wanted to make a comment. I was at the Reimagine meeting last week. Was it just last week? And Boulder really had a lot of negative comments so we really do have to make sure that boulder does stay together because they're really concerned about what's happening in boulder i kind of disagree with a lot of their comments but it's important that boulder i guess boulder county be together because they're looking for something concentrated for for them for their county i guess that's it for me all right joanna well i am from that big empty space district n so that's really what i i feel like i should address it makes me think that it would be useful to look at the Oh, square miles in each district as a piece of the information, because of course, District N is going to have sparser population. We have sparser service too in a lot of it. Um, so it's something to weigh in on when, when we try to consider how do we make that district gain population. Um, I, I'm just a little hesitant. I, I want to say I'm totally with everybody else who says, let's keep our cities together, our communities together in any way possible. And then going back to District N, maybe not fuss too much about, unless it's convenient and easy, some way to put more population there because a lot of the land space in District N is somewhat devoid of service, I would say. And, and there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. It's just the way it draws up. So that's my comment. Thank you. Andrea? Which brings to mind another comment. I mean, this is specific to what Joanna just said. Another comment at Reimagine was about Thornton. And I'm thinking, isn't District N mostly Thornton? They, again, had a lot of negative comments on what Reimagine was doing. I think it's important 
to try and keep Thornton together because they're they're actually praying for more service. I mean, Joanna just com commented that there isn't much service in that area, and that's exactly what they said at Reimagine. So that's an important district as well to keep to keep together. Which sounds like I'm saying try and keep the districts the way they are, shifting population as little as possible. Okay, Joe. Um, yeah, I have a couple things. I, I appreciate Andrea's comments about keeping things together, except I'm thinking to myself, well, if we, if, if Boulder is represented by two or three districts, they get two or three voices on the board. So it might be to the advantage of some of the communities that aren't happy to have a kind of a split district so that they get more voices on the board. Um, the other thing that I kind of struck me when Matt was talking about the 5% difference, which I appreciate, you know, one district gets 5% more and one district gets 5% less than the mean. Uh, Mike, Mike, what I notice is that that difference amounts to about 0.65 of the total um, population. So it's, in my mind, it's trivial. So I, I think, you know, the difference, the 5% difference doesn't matter. And my vote would be to go for the for the for the e-map just because it looks simpler and quicker to it's it's more straightforward to me. Anyway, thank you. Jo uh, Joe. Or John, sorry. Thanks. This is John Fusa, way out in district G. Um, I would I would agree uh, with um, the prior commentator. And given given this small percentage and number of uh, deviation in population under the alternative F map, I would I do think it's important to try and follow jurisdictional boundaries to the greatest degree possible. Certainly, from a District G resident perspective, I would um, recommend and support alternative E and kind of prioritizing to some degree those jurisdictional boundaries and rationalizations or, or having rational lines as opposed to um, trying to get the population as equal as possible. I will say I'm pleased. I don't see much evidence of gerrymandering here um, in a political sense. Um, uh, so I do, uh, it makes sense to me and being way on the Southeast corner of the, di of the district or at the outer boundaries of District G are fixed, at least for the moment, uh, if and until there were further annexation into the district approved by the board. So District G under both options and alternatives looks substantially the same to me, at least on initial glance, uh, with, that, with very little change. Um, so I think we, I would certainly be able to support both alternatives, just uh, a preference for alternative A. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, looks like you're back. Oh yeah, just a quick one. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I prefer alternative E too, but as a few people have mentioned, as we've talked about this, um, you know, it's usually the case when something comes from the state legislature that they think about counties much more than cities because it's just where the world is for them. I, the, again, I would hope that jurisdictional boundaries really looks at the cities and I'd sure have to take a much closer look at the map to figure that out. Denver of course has multiple districts. Aurora is going to have multiple districts given the population but um, if there have to be splits made which is inevitable split it split counties up and try to keep the cities together and it'd be really nice if you had some analysis of how well or poorly that would be an alternative E and what could be done about it. 
Joanna. I just wanted to encourage our group to go to the RTD website where these maps are broken out by district, by alternative. So you can really snoop around and see the details of those lines because these little maps that we see are really small. And it might, I don't know that it'll change our general viewpoints on this, but it, it certainly gives you the details that you might be looking for. My district's just easy to look at, so it doesn't matter so much. But anyway, that was just my comment. And also, if anyone has any comments you want to put in the chat uh, box, I will get those comments to Chris as well. Sounds good. I don't see anyone else, Matt. Joanna, that's got their hands up. Anyone else want to chime in? Oops, there's someone. John. John, go ahead. It not. I, I certainly understand what this um, effort and process is about in terms of uh, updating the maps and the boundaries. I do think um, it might be useful information if it was possible. I'd love to see outside of this, but maybe using whichever map ends up being selected or even both alternative Z and F, trying to maybe overlaying some of the major travel sheds um, uh, to understand the, the transportation travel sheds as they relate to the updated map that's selected um, or even the two final alternatives. Just for knowledge, kind of trying to make that population land use transportation link uh, and to help us as CAC members um, uh, to understand that uh, for the portions of the district that we live in and that we try to speak for occasionally. That's it. It's me again. I, right. I think that's a good idea. Actually, it made me start to want to know more, which might not be what everybody wants to share in, in terms of detail, it would be of interest to know based on current RTD services, um, what would change in terms of if you change a district boundary, how, what is, where is the, is the bus service gonna land in what district now? Or And it's more bus service in some ways. The, I notice when I look on line at the bigger maps, I can see the, light rail and the train service pretty easily. But do we end up putting service into a different district? I don't know if that makes a difference or not. It's just a matter of when you get people on the board fighting for your service, where's that gonna land? So it is, a lot of information could be shared with us. I also have a hunch our group is probably the most responsive and interested set of people other than folks in some local community governments that will have something to say. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean we need you to do that, but it would be of interest. Yeah, just as a point of clarification, the bus lines are also on those detailed maps that are online. Okay. Yeah, they don't read, they're in the blue, so they don't read quite as clearly as the rail maps do. If, if you blow it up, you can see it, you're yeah. correct. <laughs> I've got one of them open. All right, Matt, did you have something else? Well, yeah, I was just gonna, I mean, I, I thought about the the, uh, the uh, writer sheds and it, I mean, it's a great idea, but they all tend to be kind of, you know, linear. I think about the rail lines or, flat iron flyer and I don't know how you put that into a district I mean you'd kind of have this weird it would look like a gerrymandered district. <laughs> you'd have a weird district the good thing is yes the representative would be very focused on a heavily used um, RTD option but it would kind of leave everybody else out in the cold a bit, all the people just to the edges of those districts. And it would definitely cut across lots of jurisdictional boundaries. Flat Iron Flyer cuts through, I don't know, you know, six cities or seven cities or something like that. So I think showing it on the map a little more clearly wouldn't, wouldn't hurt. Um, it is kind of hard to see, but 
Yeah, I mean, I still think city jurisdictions are the way to go, and maybe alternative E could be tightened up a bit to even make that better again. I, I think it's hard to know without some more data from from your team, Chris, numerical data, which you, you can't get from the map. You have to have somebody, you know, get the census data and, and take a look at that. All right, back to Joanna. It's the co-chairs. <laughs> We're having a discussion, aren't we? Well, I, I've got one of the maps open on my big screen computer and, and I'm seeing it's not that we would propose to change district boundaries based on, well, here's an example. The Littleton Downtown Transit Station looks like it's in an area under Alternative E that the district boundary changes. It's kind of not totally clear. That doesn't mean we should change anything. It means that we need to be informed that that might fall into a different district with if we adopted alternative E and, and find out, well, how does the city of Littleton feel about that? And, and I don't know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you would change everything to match a travel shed that probably would, would be messy. But those things are worth considering if, if that does have an impact uh, somehow for a city. And I'm guessing that some of those people would speak up. That's all. All right, anyone else? Again, put uh, are there any, any other comments also in the chat that you can capture and give to Chris if you have any thoughts along the way um, before we conclude the meeting. All right, Chris, do you have any wrap up remarks? We thank you for your time, appreciate the Appreciate the in-depth interest. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. All right, back to Matt and Joanna. Matt, you can talk. Yeah, no, no, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. That mm. kind of hard to know where that would go, but that was that was interesting. Um, redistricting. Thankfully, uh, we don't play political games here, but I'm not sure how you would do that with RTD districting, to be quite honest. <laughs> Even if you wanted to, I don't know what the metric would be to do in that. So thanks. So Roger told me that uh, the next thing on our agenda is that we've got a quick update for on reimagine RTD from uh, Bill Roy. So Bill, you can take it away wherever you are. Okay, you caught me off guard a little bit. I thought I was thinking I was at the end of the agenda, but that's that's fine. Um, and Christina is on here as well, but I think we just wanted to make everybody aware of the public commenting, commenting tool that we have available um, for folks for the system optimization plan, which you guys are, have been briefed on over, over the you know, several meetings. Um, so that tool is, is a great, it's a GIS tool. It'll give you, you can click on it and figure out what routes are being modified or changed. And um, it is a good tool to provide specific comments um, that we can then document and then try to address as we kind of move forward with the process for hopefully adopting the system optimization plan in March with the board. Now the, the comments, um, the deadline for comments on that is February 9th. So there's still some time. And Christina, were you gonna drop the connection in the chat just so folks have that direct link if they wanna go explore and yep. check it out. So I'm that was- to pop that in. Uh, that that was my main update um, for people um, that, you know, please check that tool out and hopefully you can provide us some, any comments you might have. Yeah, that'd be great. And Roger, as usual, if you could capture that and send it to everybody, because not everybody's on this call with us today. I will do that. They may be on their phone and they can't see this stuff. Um, yeah, no, that, that'd be great. That's worth looking at. I didn't know that you had it at that level of detail to look at. So that, that would be fun. Um, of course, what I really want to know is what was Boulder County whining about? But uh, <laughs> I can guess. <laughs> Matt, it would be quicker to tell you what they are whining about. <laughs> no, I, I, it wouldn't take, take much of a guess. <laughs> Roger, would the group be uh, interested or do we have time for me to show them around the tool? Would it be a benefit? That'd be great. I, mean, I think that's, Michael uh, mm -hmm. wasn't scheduled till four, so I think we could probably do that. Let me make you a co-host. Okay. 
And Bill, I don't know if you wanted to talk on it in iDrive or if I- No, you, you drive, you're probably more familiar with the tool than I am. So I, I'm afraid I might crash if I drive. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and do that. All right. Okay, is it sharing for everyone? Mm -hmm. yes. Wonderful. Wonderful, okay. <clears throat> so um, I'm actually gonna back up a little bit here because I- Christina, you might wanna maximize that on your screen. Uh, let's see if I can, is there that looking go. better? Yep. Yes. Wonderful, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, start where I put the link in, which is the Reimagine webpage and what you'll see on that is, of course, some information and background on Reimagine, but mostly you'll see this blue box where you can enter into the area where the tool is located. <clears throat> Very similar looking at the top, but you'll see the tools right here. You'll click here on the orange to provide your feedback. And immediately you'll see this splash page pop up and it provides some direction on what the SOP is, the system optimization plan is, and how to leave a comment. So you will see that there's this icon here in the blue square <clears throat> that looks like a notepad and, and pen, and that's what you'll click on to add comments when you're ready. There's also information here at the bottom if you scroll down in Spanish and uh, co a contact information in case someone wants this, or this detail in Spanish or um, needs a little bit more clarification. So we'll go ahead and enter. And this is the main page. As you can see, all the yellow dots on this map, and those indicate areas where people have made comments already. So we've got a good amount of comments and I think we've got, we're happy to see that we've got a good amount of representation across the board. And of course, we're always looking for, for more details. So I'll go ahead and just zoom in on the center here to get a better look. And what you can see is these red lines are all, all along the map representing different routes. So I'll go ahead and click on one. And immediately you'll see here that this pulls up the Route 31, for example, and information about this particular route. It's a bus route. And here at the bottom, there's a link to an attachment. And there in that attachment, if you click on it, it'll provide information on what Route 31 currently is doing and what is proposed under the Reimagine RTD system optimization plan. And so you'll get some details on the proposed service and maybe uh, in this case, if there's some corridor travel adjustments, that's gonna be in here. So that is um, the way you can get the detail on what the current route <coughs> alignment is and what is proposed. So you can close that out um, and go back to your original area to add a comment. Say I do wanna add a comment to that Route 31. I will go to that little symbol I mentioned earlier. It looks like a notepad and a pad of paper, uh, pen and a pad of paper. <clears throat> and I'll go ahead and uh, click on this yellow dot here. And I believe I'm able to drag it anywhere that I'd like. So I'll drag it onto the map and put it here and go ahead and type my comments. So that'll get registered and over to the Reimagine team who are gonna pull all these comments together and present it to the board as part of the draft system optimization plan. And um, Bill, I think you kind of spoke on timeframes, but did you want to give a, a little bit of what, what's to be expected here? So you mean in terms of, you mean what we're going to do with the comments or? Yeah, what, what you do with the comments when the board uh, takes a look at it and then just. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, so just in terms of timeframe beyond the, the ninth, um, so we're gonna gather all comments um, by the 9th. Um, we're gonna kind of take, you know, a couple of weeks to kind of develop a response, you know, kind of how we're gonna address or not address those comments. Um, and then, you know, uh, present some of that information to the board and then basically work towards um, a, a final kind of plan that we would present at the March board meeting um, kind of the first at the, this would go to the operations committee on the 9th of March and then to the full board for adoption on the 22nd. So that's kind of the, the full plan for this. Um, you know, this is a five-year plan. I, I think that one of the comments that we have received is, you know, how do we make, how do you make changes? Can you make changes? Um, we're working on kind of a framework for that. That will be a part of that, that recommendation to the board, uh, I think, but it is our expectation that you know, any changes, this 
to this plan need to be looked at strategically and that you can't just make a bunch of changes and not understand the implications because this plan is fiscally constrained and it's focused on our resources. And particularly right now, it's focused on our, you know, how we deal with operator resources. And, and the other thing with this plan that you can think of is that we are, you know, our May run board as the way it looks right now, we're not gonna be implementing any changes associated with this plan, primarily because of our operator issue. And that, um, you know, we expect this plan implementation, the changes that are identified in this plan, because this is an increase in service over where we're at today. I mean, you know, we, we've, we've grown a little bit in the pandemic, but we're gonna grow more. And we, we've identified this is kind of a level of growth that we can get to by 2027. Um, but unfortunately we can't do it, start that growth in May just because of our operator issue. So it, it will happen over the course of, you know, our normal run board process that our service development team will be implementing some of these recommendations. Um, but, but that's kind of the expectation as we move forward. Thanks, Bill. I just want to mention one last thing here on the top right. There is a link to the draft system optimization plan. So you can click on this and see the SOP plan in its entirety. So you can kind of get a comparison on a list basis. Yeah, that's good. I was going to ask that. Um, it seemed painful to click on every single line. Um, and not, not that I know many of these routes very well, but um, just kind of scrolling through and eyeballing them. It, it might be nice, and I don't know if you've done this in any way, to call out the ones that have the most substantial changes. You know, something where you're going from, I, I'm just making this up entirely, three buses an hour to four buses an hour or something like that. Okay, that's a change, but it's not a huge change. And I'm just kind of curious about which of the many routes really have the big changes, um, you know, they're going away, they're doubling their service, they're extending their service, something that I would think we and the board would, would kind of like to know about. And it'd be hard to gather that by scrolling through the 127 pages or whatever it was of the whole plan. Well, one of, one of the things that has included in the report is um, it's, it's a route by route piece, but there also is information about what routes are not coming back because there is, you know, several routes that we're proposing not to bring back from work from our pre-COVID service. And so there's a matrix in, in the full report about those particular routes and kind of the reasoning for not bringing them back. Because, I mean, you know, we did some adjustments to some routes that, you know, to eliminate things, we added some new routes that replaced old routes. And so there, you know, it's kind of this mishmash of reasoning as to why um, we don't have that. Yeah, if you can, I don't know if you can jump down to that, Christina, if it, just to show you kind of where it is, it's, yeah, yeah keep going. Think, uh, there we go. So these are, these are the routes that you can see. There's, I think there's a matrix, there's like three slides of the routes um you know a big one on here is the c and the f line that we're not proposing to bring back you know in this part of this plan um so um we are you know those kinds of things are clearly identified um in this process again you know and again we don't want to emphasize this but again this plan is a service cut you know over where we were at in 2019 it's not bringing back service to the level that we had in 2019 so it is it is you got to look at it that way too, as well. Hmm. And do you have information on? I saw a couple of charts go by. It looked like there was some analysis about people served and so on. Um, just kind of wondering if you have any information on route by route that is correlated to this document about the ridership. Yes, the pre pandemic ridership, because Right now, that's the only ridership that probably has a makes any stable sense. We don't really know what's going to happen post pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we have any specific information that's, you know, I know there's there is route the ridership information that I don't think and it was used in the analysis, but we don't have like a, a link to it that you can actually get to it. I think if you people are interested in that, that they have to make a specific request. 
to service planning for that level of information. Okay. Ms. Heather, I have a question. Um, is this just a draft, this document you're looking at? This isn't on yeah. the website, right? Uh, no, this, well, this document that you have is connected to, and I don't know, Christine, if you want to go back to the, the web tool. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is connected to the web tool. Um, it's up in the upper right. There's to view the draft o SOP recommendations. You can click on Got it. There Thank you. And just get a connection to the document. So easy question. Is the 122X one of the routes that's gone? Uh, yeah, I believe so it is. Wow. That is at Denver. That's our pop most popular route. Easily. I believe it is. When you say Denver, you mean Denver employees? For Correct. Yeah. That's kind of my... Your keyword? Yeah. yeah. Andrea, you have a question? Um, actually, a comment. I think it would be a good idea to put the trains in a different color. It would make the whole system would make more sense if the trains, the train routes were in a different color. And we can, you can actually, Christine, if you go to the, I can't remember what part of the tool it is. Yeah, that you can go to that and you can hide, you can actually highlight on the map bus routes, rail routes, like if you, like, the, like yeah, like that one. You can click on that and then it'll come up and it'll show you the rail routes in a different color. And I, I think it should actually be that way, period. You shouldn't have to call it out. Mm -hmm. okay. Because it does allow you to see buses intersecting with trains. And that's really important. I think I've been suggesting for months now that the F should go away. And now I see that that's planned. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions or comments for Bill? All right. Great. I guess Matt, back to you for the agenda. Next item. Oh, me. Okay, well, I can, I can make something up. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, both of you, Bill and Christina, that that is interesting. It's a it's a good a good use of GIS as a as a tool, and I I would encourage people on the CAC and folks you know to uh, get your comments in, um, particularly if you have some strong feelings about any particular bus or rail line um, and how the service is proposed to be changed. This is our chance to, you know, get our thoughts out there that the, the staff and the board can see. We've got a couple of weeks to do it. So, uh, yeah, I, I, that would be great. Thanks. So, Roger, I think what's next on our agenda is um, having um, a uh, Another appearance from Michael Davies for RTD Government Relations. We came a little while ago when he was quite new to the job and just kind of gave us a hello. Um, but we're delighted to have him back to um, talk to him. I assume about maybe the upcoming legislative session, among other things. Yes, hello, this is Michael Davies, Government Relations Officer for RTD. Uh, thank you, members of the CAC, uh, for having me and allowing me to present. Give me a moment here, and I'll pull up some slides. Um, and hopefully, I'll turn off this phone right now. Um, and let me know if you all don't see this slide. Do you all see the government relations update slide? Good, sounds good. Yes. Um, so just wanted to take a moment to uh, go through and um, uh, Mr. Applebaum, as you mentioned, just give a quick update on uh, government relations for RTD and kind of what we're focusing on, um, but also take the opportunity to touch on 
a little bit of uh, the discussion that the CAC had in December with Senator Winter on how the SB 260 available state dollars for transit, how that flows through the various different ways that, that it will flow and how RTD interacts with, with that process and how we're, and, and just give a little more perspective on the RTD side of how we're looking at that. Um, so uh, this is, I'm just gonna quickly touch on uh, SB 260 and the Multimodal Transportation and Mitigations Options Fund. Um, and of course that's the multimodal, multimodal options fund that, that existed previously. And then they changed the title of it in SB 260 to the Multimodal Transportation and Options Fund, largely the same program and, and same purposes. Um, I'm gonna touch on the Dr. Cog tip process and then uh, quickly on state and federal updates. Um, so with regard to SB 260 and the Multimodal Transportation Options Fund, um, you know, one of the discussion items that, that Senator Winter brought up with you all is, is what is that funding available for? And RTD is in full agreement with, with Senator Winter that is absolutely available for operations funding. It can fund both transit operations and transit construction. Um, that was an important piece that I, I think that they, they did make sure that this funding was available for that. Um, you know, 85% of the, of the multimodal funding, of the transit funding, I'm going to refer to it as, as the state transit funding, 85% um, of that funding goes to the MPOs. And so for the RTD region, that's Dr. Cog. And so for the vast majority of all the funding that will be collected that, that's currently available there and that will be collected in the future in multimodal, really kind of goes through Dr. Cog. 15% of it is retained by CDOT. And, um, and then the last point I have here is just that, uh, you know, to give perspective and scale on the entire size of that fund. So all the way from 22 through 27, Dr. Cog is estimating the total amount of multimodal funding available will be $165 million. Just to put that in perspective, RTD's annual one-year operating budget is $743 million. So you can see just perspective-wise how much money over multi-years is available for transit and what RTD's resources currently go into transit. Um, you know, one of the pieces, and, and just to go back to that top bullet point there, on available funding for transit operations and construction, um, where you can find who has used that in the past and how they've used it is you can largely go to the Dr. Cog tip process, right? And the transportation improvement plan for a, a four-year span will lay out all the project that Dr. Cog funds. And if you go through and look at uh, all of the projects that are in the current tip and that used multimodal options fund that was previously available and, and largely is, is available in the future through SB 260, there's only one entity that, that thought about using that funding for transit operations, and that was Boulder. Boulder actually went ahead and just changed that. They put in a request in December and canceled the, the transit funding that they had from Dr. Cog that they were gonna expand the hop service um, and, and basically run the hop service out a little further than it currently goes. They've decided to not do that and use that money instead for another purpose that is not transit operations. So I, I only highlight that as it is available for transit operations, but it is not used widely and not very conducive to fund transit operations. And, and just in reviewing the December meeting, um, Mr. Applebaum, you, you, I think, mentioned, you know, how does, how does SB 260 money interact with transit operations? Because generally transit operations requires multi-year, you know, uh, 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 funding that's going to be there and going to be certain funding that we can count on. And, and that, I think, is one of the problems with how the SB 260 money flows through Dr. Cog and how the Dr. Cog process puts that out, it makes it very difficult for an agency like RTD to say, oh, we can plan five years, 10 years down the line and, and plan on having money there that will be dedicated to transit service. So um, 
thought that would be helpful just to highlight that. Um, this is a slide that just shows you the CDOT side of CDOT's budget. So this is CDOT's FY23 budget that they presented to the General Assembly um, uh, last month. And this is just to kind of highlight, again, the scale of what's available for transit operations funding and what's not. And so that 15% that goes to CDOT, CDOT, of course, um, you know, puts it all into their budget here. And if you go down to this very last gray bar at the end here, that's the multimodal funding, but it's also the state safety education, capital construction fund, and state infrastructure fund all combined into this last lighter gray bar. And so that, again, I think just highlights that it's a very small amount of money when compared to overall budget operations when we look at that. Um, the next thing I wanted to touch on was just the Dr. Cog tip process. And um, this is something that, that uh, within RTD, we're very much paying attention to, uh, focused on. We wanna be a, a, a part of that process. We wanna partner with the jurisdictions that are going to be, you know, submitting projects. You know, we want to actively find how we can leverage that state money and other Dr. Cog money to not only benefit RTD uh, priorities, but uh, uh, encourage other cities and regions to invest money in things that would be good for transit: uh, better bus stops, better sidewalks getting to those bus stops bike lanes getting to those bus stops, um, anything like that in the transit-oriented development realm, this kind of funding is available for. I think RTD is uh, excited to be a, be a good partner with all of the local jurisdictions in that process. So within the Dr. Cog tip process, they're gonna kick this off very soon here. Um, they're gonna do two separate calls for projects, which is a call for project is basically their application saying, hey, please send us your uh, projects and your priorities and available funding that you have. And we'll start working through and see if we can and include them in the uh, transportation improvement plan that gets adopted by uh, Dr. Cog. And so they'll start that uh, two calls that will go over the next one and a half years here. Um, they're gonna split those calls into two calls for a specific reason. The first call uh, that will be coming out here from my understanding in late January, um, and, and hopefully I think that the timeline on that is, is late January and then to amend the TIP, have the Dr. Cog board vote and amend the TIP by uh, September of this year. So during that time, um, they are doing that specific call to amend the current TIP because much of the funding that was in SB 260 was federal funding that came out of the COVID uh, relief bills that the state got. And so the state kind of front loaded the SB 260 multimodal transit funding with federal funding, but that federal funding needs to be spent or needs to be obligated by fiscal year 24. And so that's why they're kind of pushing this ahead and want it, they want to earmark as much of that money and put it into the TIP process as soon as possible so that jurisdictions uh, can go ahead and get to work and try to spend that money as fast as possible and make sure that it doesn't expire on the federal side. So that's kind of why they're doing uh, the, the, the first TIP call um, and, and that'll be focused on amending the current TIP. Um, now the second TIP call that will be from September uh, of this year through April of 23, that call will incorporate some other federal funding. Um, you know, th this will be more of the normal process that Dr. Cog goes through to develop a four-year TIP. And so we'll, we'll be paying attention to both of those calls and working with jurisdictions there. Um, and then, you know, the last piece of it to kind of know, I think, about the Dr. Cog TIP process is that 80% of the funding that Dr. Cog puts out and, and again, just for perspective, the total funding amount for 20 through, 22 through 27, and now this is not just the state transit funding, this is all Dr. Cog money that they'll be putting out, is in the realm of about $487 million. So it's, it's a good chunk of money, about a half, million, half billion dollars that will go out for the whole Dr. Cog region um, through these two calls. 
Now, 80% of that funding will go to local projects, meaning that you know, a city or um, a non-regional project, meaning that it spans multiple jurisdictions, um, a local project, those will be 80% of the funds. So, you know, city of Boulder applies, city, city, county of Denver applies, et cetera, et cetera. And everybody splits that up and that's the, the bulk of the money. Um, and then 20% is dedicated to regional priorities. Um, in many cases, RTD projects do fall more into that regional category than the local category, but not always. And again, just to give you a kind of perspective on how Dr. Cog is going to spend that money and that really the bulk of it is more at the local level. And of course, then for RTD, that really is working with our local partners to see how we can best support them and, and we can support each other in, in the goals of uh, uh, improving transit. Um, and Yeah, and again, you know, just put one more one more uh, bullet down there. Um, again, this is just on the transit funding. The Dr. Cog estimates that out of the SB 260 multimodal transit funding, it's about 165 million total uh, all the way through 2027, and that means then 132 million of that will kind of be local projects, and then 33 million of it kind of dedicated to more regional projects. So um, that is it for the uh, Dr. Cog tip process. And then this is my last slide. I just wanted to quickly touch on a few uh, state and federal issues. You know, obviously the state just kicked off the beginning of their uh, session at the General Assembly. So uh, RTD is very much tracking bills that are coming out. One bill that I wanted to just flag for you all that seems to have um, um, a, a positive uh, impact on transit is the HB uh, 2210026, and that's the Alternative Transportation Options Tax Credit. So currently, Colorado does have a tax credit for employers who purchase transit passes. It's not very much. It's about a 4% or a little, about a 4.5% tax credit on the amount that they spend on an employee's transit pass. So it's not a huge incentive. This bill, 1026, would change that 4% and increase that to a 50% refundable tax credit for businesses. So when compared to 4.5%, a 50% tax credit back to the business for any business that's buying, say, an eco pass for their employees, to get 50% backs and a tax credit, that, that is a pretty good incentive. Um, uh, uh, it's from a policy perspective, when you look at it compared to the rest of the nation and compare other states that have these programs, um, this would put Colorado kind of in the lead from a state perspective in uh, incentivizing uh, employers to buy transit passes. So we'll certainly be tracking that bill. Um, there is the ozone air quality improvement transit days. Um, Senator Faith Winter touched on this bill when she spoke with you all. Um, there isn't a lot of detail on that. I have, we haven't seen a draft yet and there, there isn't a, a draft submitted, but obviously uh, this is something that RTD is, is paying very close attention to. Uh, the background on this, of course, it came kind of before before this is, was raised at the state level, the RTD Accountability Committee um, you know, raised the recommendation to say, hey, can you put some money toward uh, uh, fare free transit and, and put that as a recommendation in, in the full recommendations that they submitted to us. And uh, in the meeting, in the final meeting discussing the recommendations, uh, our general manager, Deborah Johnson, mentioned that while while we can't use the federal COVID relief money to do that, there are other available monies. And specifically, she highlighted the CMAC, which is a federal um, uh, federal uh, formula funds program. It's the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Funds. Those funds do go through Dr. Cog, but they are available for programs like a, and, and, and this was a program that was offered in California and our general manager 
uh, was involved with that. So, so knew that those kind of funds were available for it. It was a spare the air days program that offered uh, basically an incentive to say, hey, come out and try transit on the most uh, heavily impacted air quality days that we have and try to try to incentivize long-term uh, changes. And maybe we get a few more riders and maybe we're, we retain those riders through a program like that. So uh, I mentioned that, and then we'll of course be uh, following that closely. Um, one bill I didn't put on here, but that has been introduced is, and this is a repeat bill from last year, is, um, but with a different sponsor, Senator Jim Smallwood is going to sponsor or has sponsored and introduced a bill to uh, allow the town of Parker to have an election to opt in or opt out of the RTD district. Um, this bill was offered last year and was pulled last year from consideration, but um, it, this will be coming back again this year. Um, and uh, I don't have the, I didn't list it on there. So, but just wanted to flag that for you because it has been introduced. Um, Moving to the federal side, uh, you know, really the focus from uh, an administrative standpoint is implementing the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or as many might call it, the BIL or Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Um, so that bill, it does require quite a few um, regulatory changes at, or at FTA and FTA has really said they're, they're, their focus is on staffing up. They're gonna really have to staff up at FTA to administer the new grant programs, to administer the size of the grant programs because the, the, a lot of these grant programs, while they didn't change a lot from a policy perspective, they did get a significantly um, um, large amount of uh, funding in the increase there. So they do need some staff to be able to administer all this. So really we're, we're at RTD very much focused on that regulatory side paying attention to um, uh, guidance that gets put out, uh, making sure that we are getting feedback and responding to FTA to make sure that we'll be able to interact with those programs in the best manner possible. And then lastly, just on fiscal year 22 appropriations, um, because the federal government is currently running on a continuing resolution, which means they're running on last year's funding, and FY21 funding levels. What that means for implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law is that all of the funding increases won't be realized until Congress completes a full FY23 appropriations that matches up with that bipartisan infrastructure law. So currently, FTA hasn't been able to say put out the funding increase, which for RTD is roughly uh, about a 30% increase in our formula funding, but we won't be able to realize that until Congress acts on a full year. I, I believe it's February 18th. I could be wrong on that date, but it's late February, I believe is when the current continuing resolution expires at the federal level. And we're really hoping, and, and a lot of our focus is on, and as, as well as the, the focus of the entire transit industry nationally, is really on getting Congress to enact a full FY23 appropriations so that we do realize that 30% gain in formula funding that RTD can see. And, and that will really help with things like state of good repair and uh, bus purchases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is all I have and, and happy to, to take any questions. Um, I'll stop sharing here if I can. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. That That's a lot actually. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, anybody who has uh, questions or comments on anything Michael uh, presented. And Michael, by the way, we're pretty informal. First names work, saves a lot of time. Um, anybody have, uh, I mean, I've got a couple, but let, let's see if anybody else has got any thoughts on, on any of this. A lot to digest. All right. Well, let me ask you. I'll kick it off. Good. All right. I, I'll just ask you two, two things that popped into my head. One is um, the uh, the Dr. Cog money. Um, given the 
the apparent difficulties of using that money for operating expenses um, because of the uncertainty of long-term availability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do, do you, does it look like RTD, in fact, is going to try to apply for some of that money, but not for operating expenses for construction or maintenance or whatever? Or do, do you and RTD know yet? I don't think we know yet. We I don't want to get ahead of, of course, our internal process. And, and of course, we have to uh, bring this kind of before before our board and educate folks and and but but our intent is to absolutely uh, be a part of that process and work with Dr. Cog uh, partners, um, it, it, but also at the same time there are priorities within RTD that we know we need, and we're going through that process to figure out what are the best projects that apply and, and that this funding is eligible for and, and then kind of prioritize those. And, and I, you know, so I think it's a little early for me to say how much, you know, what we're gonna apply for and how we'll do that, but more or less we are gonna be a part of that process and, and we'll be actively looking to leverage that money as best we possibly can. Okay. Yeah, it'd also be great, and you mentioned this, if RTD could find some partners among the, uh, the local governments um, you could team up with to do some things using their allocations, whether that be, you know, better service on some routes or improved bus stops or whatever it might be, um, because that would, that would obviously leverage the money more. So um, I hope that that'll be looked at. Any other immediate question I have, common question, is that whole air quality money. We talked about this a little bit in um, December about how I think a number of us thought that um, using that money to just have free fares on the worst air quality days probably wasn't gonna buy us much. And I, I guess that's still all being investigated as to how the money will be spent. Be interesting to know more about how that did or didn't work in California. Um, I'll just say again that I find it very hard to believe that on potentially relatively short notice, um, that people are just gonna change their travel behaviors for a day or two days here and there um, because the fare is free. I just don't think that's how people decide when and how to use transit. It, it takes a little more work than that. Um, so I, yeah, we didn't make a recommendation. I don't think we quite know enough, but it'd be, it'd be great to kind of stay apprised of that and understand what RTD's thinking. And, you know, if you'd like us to weigh in more, we, we could, but we'd need to discuss it as a group. Yeah, certainly, and, and just a, um, a a bit of background, kind of on the California program, and and to your point, um, California's program did evolve over years, and where it where it last ended up was much more of a very certain specific days, where at the beginning of the summer it was kind of advertised and said this day, this day, this day over this entire air quality span. Um, or air quality impacted span of time when we know that th these are the dates for the worst air quality, we're going to mark specific days and they would go ahead and fund enough days to cover that. And, and so it was well advertised and people could go ahead and start saying, and, you know, I don't, there's been some research on, um, you know, an air, a UC Berkeley air quality professor did some research on the California program and didn't find a lot of air quality improvement benefits and wasn't able to tie the program specifically to say, oh, this dropped GHG by X amount of percent. That, that wasn't really ever able to be uh, found in a concrete way. It was largely a, um, the policy goal was largely to just incentivize behavior that would be better for air quality and hopefully over time, you're just incentivizing a, 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 a better transit usage and those kind of practices to be 
you know, tried by people and it, maybe a few of them, like I said, uh, become retained customers and keep riding transit more and more. And I think that was really the, the, the focus of how California's program ended up in the end. And Matt, it looks like you've got a follow up on that. Yeah, no, I just, um, we've run a couple of numbers on the fare free transit bill idea and the $28 million in the Gov's budget proposal. And it seems like that should cover about three and a half months. I think we're hoping to get a little bit more to really cover, you know, May to September, the full ozone season. So, um, yeah, but that, that bill's still in the works. I, I did have another question, um, which is about the HETF. Um, and I've asked this question time and again to people at Dr. Cog and, and CDOT staff, and I can't really seem to get a straight, confident answer. So I'm hoping you can help me, Michael. Um, but yeah, it, it seems like, you know, reading the Colorado code um, that, you know, the local HETF surely is available for both transit capital and transit operating costs, and arguably the same for the for the state HETF. And, um, you know, you mentioned the multimodal options fund. It is kind of like small beans compared to, um, you know, RTD's operating budget, but the HETF is you know, over a billion dollars a year. So I'm curious whether RTD has, you know, applied for that money, you know, yeah, in the CDOT 10 year planning process or Dr. Cog in the TIP process, or you know, working with local governments to try to um, you know, get some of that local HUTF money. Just looking at, you know, we've got this new greenhouse gas policy from CDOT, and they did all this modeling showing that we need to, you know, double transit ridership in the next 10 years. Um, it seems like a good time for the state's largest transit agency to go ask for help um, in, in expanding service. So I'm, I'm wondering what RGB has done on that? You know, to my knowledge, we haven't applied to that, but I also, um, to my knowledge, don't, don't know if that opportunity has ever even been a possibility. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't know how that process would have worked for us, you know, specifically, you know, I know when you look at the SB 260 money, there still isn't a lot of clarity toward how RTD applies or how they put that money out there and cr kind of create grant programs to apply for. Um, so, so my, I guess the, the short answer is, is no, not to my knowledge in the past have, have we gone after the H2 HDF or HDUF uh, side of the funding there. You might, you might, oops. I might quickly explain HUTF to some people who may not know quite what you're talking about. Well, it's, it basically, it's just the gas tax. Um, the the funds funds collected from the the Colorado specific gas tax. That's what flows into HUF, and that is largely uh, the fund that that supports CDOT's 10-year uh, plan. You know, the two largest sources are federal funding and then state gas tax. And th those are certainly the bulk of uh, CDOT's budget. All right, any other questions or comments from the gang? You know, if I can, just one more uh, follow-up on, on uh, what Matt mentioned on the, you know, 28 million is kind of identified What's still unclear about that bill as well, and a lot of what I've heard is that it won't be so much focused just on non-attainment areas, but much more of a statewide total. So that, that, that's the way I'm hearing it is there's a strong possibility that that will be available statewide to all transit agencies in the state. I don't see anybody else's hand up. Just one other quick thing that you can keep us surprised of, and that's the whole Parker um, issue. Um, well, yeah, that would be very interesting. I find it hard to believe the state legislature is going to let Parker decide to get out. Um, not only are there, are there huge issues about for the debt. <laughs> well, and, Matt, it's happened before when Castle Rock opted out of the district. And I know a Michael can also mention, I mean, Longmont's had. I don't know how serious the conversations they've had, but I mean, they have had conversations internally. The one thing I would highlight, um, that I'd highlight about that bill that may be different from the Castle Rock process, for example, 
is there is language in that bill that says that that Parker will continue to pay its financial obligations that that voters approved ultimately on the bonds that support RTD's projects that are built or yeah the, the basically bonds on the base system bonds on fast tracks projects and they'll continue to pay those financial obligations only if RTD provides them a greater level of service and they they define it as reasonably proportional amount of service and of course i think you know as, as anybody can kind of come up quickly when you have limited resources and it says well, you have to provide more service down there. That means pulling service from somewhere else. So it, it does seem like that language specifically might be problematic for the rest of the district and how it functions with RTD. Let me just rip the district apart. No other little problem. I mean, the fact is that Denver gets a disproportional amount of service as they need to. And probably everybody else gets boulders kind of in the middle there gets a disproportionate lack of service relative to the money they put in because everybody can't get more than they put in. Um, I'm pretty sure mathematically that doesn't work, but I can double check that. Uh, so yeah, I think we just ripped the whole district apart. I, I can't imagine the state legislature going down that route, but yeah, I never know. And it'd be kind of interesting to follow it. So thanks for letting us know about that. And, and all the other cool things you're working on. Um, if, you know, if you need us to, to weigh in or even go help lobby on something, um, let us know for sure. Absolutely. All right, thank you much. All right, any other questions for Michael? All right. Thank you all. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. So just a couple other um, items and updates. Uh, we will be sending out a meeting schedule. I mean, everyone's got the meeting schedule. We put the link on calendars to June. Uh, I think we want to talk about the March agenda. Uh, we have uh, been, uh, Matt and Joanna have been talking a lot about an in-person meeting just to get to know people in a, you know, in a distance as best as we can. We're going to suggest that for the March meeting. It looks like we've got two really uh, good uh, agenda items on uh, February, a, a pretty comprehensive discussion around Title IX, or Title VI, excuse me, uh, <laughs> with our civil rights folks. And then Denver has a uh, presentation of, uh, that they'd like input on. They actually came to uh, Christina, talked to Christina about uh, with wanting to engage the CAC. And um, so that is also uh, likely on the February agenda. And if we do uh, something, I, I see a note from uh, uh, Andrea, we would, uh, we would still have a Zoom link option um, for the March meeting, but we'd hope people would just get a chance with, to you know, come together and get uh, We have a lot of you that have not been, we've never had an in-person meeting since several of you have joined the committee. So I wanted to get what people thought. Matt, do you have some thoughts on that or Joanna? Yeah, just, to, just to follow up, I mean, Joanna and, and uh, Roger and I have chatted a bit and we are still hoping to do March in person. Maybe we can be in between Greek letters um, with COVID with any sort of luck. Um, you know, you never know what's going to happen, but Roger's got some space where I think we'd be pretty safe um, to meet. And of course, we would have a call-in option. That goes without saying, um, mm -hmm. circumstances. Um, you know, the, the February meeting might have a lot on it, but I think, I think we're up for it. Um, I think, frankly, it'd be good to have a meeting where we've got a couple of issues we can really get into and, and get involved in. So um, I hope we can hold to that schedule. Joanna, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I agree with what you said. I, uh, we've discussed it and we feel pretty strongly that we can do the February meeting um, as Roger just presented. And 
March, we'd love to do it in person. Something could change, but at this point, let's shoot for that. I think it's, we talked about wanting to meet with board members and it was like, wait a minute, we don't even get to see each other yet. We really need to get together with our own people. Um, and we will be uh, scheduling those one-on-ones with board members. That is in the in the works. And uh, I'll have a, a spreadsheet out to you soon that people can then pick and choose which meetings they'd like to go to. Okay. So anyone else that has... Uh, um, uh, any comments uh, about trying to get together in person, if at all possible, with the understanding that we would have the call-in also? Uh, I do. So one of the things I want to mention is that uh, it's these meetings are at 3 o'clock, and personally right now I, take, I have my computer running as I'm doing my other job mm -hmm. right now. So if we're going to meet in person, I would like to uh, push that back to 5. If the meeting is later in the day, then I could be there. Well, that's worth maybe considering. Roger, I think you'd have to send the email out to people and get a sense of if it were somewhat later in the day, would that allow us to pick up more people? At least for this one in-person meeting, we'll deal with later meetings, you know, afterwards. But Happy to, I'll put a, an email out and get everyone's input on that. I mean, if that is a way to get more people, uh, you know, there, and I think, you know, I think the, the purpose of this meeting really is to get to know each other a little bit better, uh, rather than have a, a significant uh, packed agenda. So uh, we can certainly look at a, a, a little bit different. So I'll send an email out and you all can let me know what you think. Okay. Sounds good. All right, I think Bill had one other item that was under other business that he was going to talk about, and then we'll open it up to anyone else. Thanks, Roger. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, request from this group, um, so many of you know that the account of, about the accountability and the recommendations they made to RTD um, this past summer, I think their final report was in July. Um, and uh, one of the recommendations was for the establishment of sub-regional service councils. Um, and um, in our response to the re request or to the recommendation, um, our general manager and CEO, Deborah Johnson, um, agreed to form a working group that would help to provide input to the formation of those um, councils. And so what I'm asking is if there is a member of the CAC who would like to be involved with that working group, um, the expectation is um, that that working group would meet in February and March. Uh, we're hoping, you know, three, maybe four meetings max um, with the idea that we would address things like who should be on those groups, um, what's their purpose. And one of the big issues that was um, discussed at the accountability committee what there wasn't a final recommendation was what's the geographic basis for those groups so um, we we um, there will be several of us on staff that will be participating and then we are asking for representatives from you know counties as well as other groups to have a kind of a fairly broad um, work group and so this is not the work group, this is not going to be a sub-regional council, but just a work group that will have input to the formation of those groups. And then the, the, the staff will take that input, help to form a recommendation to the board that we would do later this spring. So that's the ask. So if there is anybody on the um, CAC who would be interested, um, we would certainly love for your participation. Hey, Roger. Um, I uh, well, maybe somebody right here can think fast enough and decide they're interested, but um, since we obviously are missing a number of our members, it might be really good if you send out an email to everybody, including the many people who aren't on this call or have had to leave early, um, 
and let's see if we can get a person who is willing to volunteer. But um, you know, you I'm willing to up. volunteer. Okay. Well, let's. I think we should still send out an email okay. and and see what's up. Um, but Heather, I, that's great. Um, I, and I'm I, happy to send that out. But I think Heather also. Um, uh, you know, Heather, we can kind of plan on you unless someone else jumps in. Um, yeah. So sure. we can get Bill the name right away. But I'll I'll touch base with who isn't here. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Sure. So we, we talked about the these committees a little bit, and I think had a somewhat mixed mixed reaction to their benefits and what exactly they'd be working on. So I hope our representative, Heather, if it's you, which I think is likely, kind of carries along some of the thoughts that that we had on the CAC. 